pere, 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 Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Crap Cafe. I hope you're ready because I have an extra special video planned for you. Today's dish is one that I've had simmering since I first launched this channel. If you're familiar, my very first theories were focused on the East Blue Saga, one of the few sagas in all of One Piece that has main antagonists who seemingly vanish after the events of their arc. A rather clear deviation from most of the more recent antagonists in the series, who often still loom in the background, awaiting their time again in the spotlight. Before my theory videos, this was certainly true for three of the main villains of the East Blue Saga. The Black Cat, Captain Kuro, the Iron Pirate, Don Krieg, and the despicable Fishman, Arlong. With Kuro, I explored his connections to the Cypherpool Agency his abilities, and a past that quite neatly links him to the same events that got Who's Who thrown in jail. Similarly, with Don Krieg, I explored how he is likely a former member of the Hapo Navy, and a relative to Don Chenjiao and Don Sai, skipped over for leadership and cast out, where he has been on a tirade to heal his wounded pride ever since. And now, remarkably, Krieg has actually just recently made a reappearance in the story, opening up even more possibilities for him to encounter the Grand Fleet and his former family. So, with this new revelation, I want to take another swing at the antagonists of the East Blue saga, because there was one villain from the East Blue that at the time, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't find any evidence that Oda still had any narrative plans for this character. In fact, it was a struggle to find anything about this character's whereabouts at all. It was almost like they actually vanished from the series. So, for today's video, you can call me Detective Trent, because that's where this theory begins. By unraveling this mystery and answering the question, Where is Arlong? We learn from Hachi's cover story that after the events of Kokoyashi Village, Arlong and the rest of the Arlong pirates were captured and taken away on a marine ship. And Hachi is the only known crew member who managed to escape. Taking to the sea, he used his superior speed in the water to avoid recapture, and began to head back towards Fishman Island, where he met Kami and they began their takayaki business. And this is where his story picks back up when the crew eventually bumps into him again on their approach towards the Red Line in Fishman Island. But while we can follow Hachi's movements after Kokoyashi Village, this is the very last sighting of the rest of the Arlong pirates. The general consensus of the One Piece community is that after his arrest, Arlong was sent to Impel Down. But for whatever reason, Oda simply chose not to include him or show him again whatsoever. However, I have two key pieces of evidence that lead me to believe that Arlong never even arrived at Impel Down to begin with. First off, the Impel Down breakout arc is one that Oda was very carefully building in the background of the series, as well as his manga exclusive cover stories. In fact, this may be something that most anime-only watchers are completely unaware of, but each one of the characters we reunite with in Impel Down were actually telegraphed by Oda. In the Baroque Works cover story, after a series of escapes and arrests, the full Baroque Works crew are reunited behind bars while awaiting further transport. It's here that they band together and bust out yet again. However, this time, the senior members of the crew decide to sacrifice themselves to let their comrades escape and allow themselves to be taken to Impel Down, where they would sit and wait for over 200 chapters before we ever saw them again. But from that point, their presence in Impel Down was guaranteed, whether the story would ever take us there or not. Additionally, Buggy, the only other character we reunited with in Impel Down, was also shown in the corner of some newspapers for the most eagle-eyed of viewers. We can even draw further comparisons by looking towards the New World section of the story, where even Doflamingo has been imprisoned there. And even more recently, Oda made an effort to point out the capture of King Queen and Weevil by Greenbull, meaning they will also be moving into the prison system soon, hinting to some that Oda might be planning some sort of Impel Down 2.0. So if seemingly every character, relevant or not, has had their movements painstakingly tracked, 
then why is it that Arlong is the only one getting the silent treatment from Oda? It's not like he didn't have a cover story showing him being carted off, and it's not as if Oda forgot about him completely, because he gave him a pretty sizable backstory in the Fishman Island arc. It can't even be an issue of timing, considering that Crocodile's crew were all admitted into Impel Down by the time that Luffy and the crew were fighting CP9 on Innie's lobby. So if Arlong was headed to Impel Down, he certainly should have arrived long before the point of the breakout. So we have to ask, once again, where is Arlong, and why didn't we see him in Impel Down? Well, this actually leads perfectly to my next point. Because maybe this isn't something that has anything to do with Arlong in particular. Now, bear with me for a moment, but I just want you to stop and think back to Impel Down. Specifically, I want you to envision as many of the prisoners as you can. Now, I want you to stop and think about this. With the exception of Jinbei, who was only on timeout in Impel Down until after the war, there isn't a single fishman to be seen in the prison. In fact, there was also another big shot fishman that some of us were hoping to possibly see in Impel Down. Someone who we know for a fact was taken through the gates of justice in Amy's lobby. I'm talking about one of the manliest men in the series, Frankie's adopted father Tom. Once you really begin to think about it, it's not just Arlong, but every single fishman that's been taken by the world government has seemingly vanished. Where are they all going? Are they being executed or taken elsewhere? Well, in this case, I don't think our missing fishmen have all been executed. Instead, I think they may be receiving a much more terrible fate. You see, while it's not often thought about, merely the existence of Impel Down, the great underwater prison, implies the use of fishman slavery by the world government, as, quite frankly, no one else would be capable of building an underwater castle. And not only has the world government's use of fishman slavery long been documented, we were even given a few details as to the extent of this slavery. As humans only started to consider fishman as more than mere fish roughly 200 years ago. If humanity has been subjugating and enslaving the fishman race for the better part of a millennia, then it's almost certain that the celestial dragons are still secretly practicing this egregious act. So, what if instead of going to serve out their punishment and impel down, fishmen in the One Piece world are instead secretly taken to Mary Joa to live as slaves to the Celestial Dragons, continuing the terrible practice? In fact, we can prove that even as much as 20 years ago, there was an entire colony of fishmen that was imprisoned in Mary Joa. Because this is the very reason that the fishman hero, Fisher Tiger, climbed the red line in order to free all of his fish brothers and sisters that were enslaved there. So now that we've narrowed down a likely location for our missing fishmen, with our initial question finally answered, we still need to go one step further. Because I really want to hammer home just how certain I truly am that Arlong and his crew are currently being held in Mary Joas. So let's take a moment to answer our next question. Why is Arlong and Mary Joas? And to do that, we need to talk about his time with the Sun Pirates, a band of rebellious and brave fishmen, captained by the legendary fishman hero, Fisher Tiger. Now, I mentioned Tiger briefly earlier, but I didn't really stop to give him the recognition he deserves. You see, Fisher Tiger is one of the dopest characters in the series, in the Malcolm X of the fishman world. Before Tiger ever became known as the hero of the Fishman, he was a famous explorer who was captured and sold as a slave to the Celestial Dragons. While we still aren't exactly sure as to how, at some point 16 years ago, Tiger was able to escape his enslavement in Mary Joa and make his way back to Fishman Island. But despite the fact that he was now free, he felt haunted by the thought of all those he had left behind. So after regaining his strength, he set out to accomplish something that might just be one of the craziest feats in the series. Because in order to sneak back into Mary Joa unseen, he decided to climb up the red line with nothing but his bare fucking hands. A feat that puts Luffy scaling the drum mountains to shame. Once he reached the top of the red line, Tiger began freeing as many slaves as he could. While he went in with the goal of saving the fishmen enslaved there, he couldn't help but free the humans and other races that were trapped there as well. It was actually in this raid that the young Boa Hancock and her sisters, 
Marigold and Sandersonia were freed from their captivity. After successfully freeing a majority of the slaves, Tiger and the newly freed people rampaged through the castle on their way to escape for safety, leaving the Celestials with an experience they would never forget, nor forgive. But simply fleeing Mary Joa isn't enough to truly escape the clutches of the Celestial Dragons, because as a symbol of their power and control, the Celestial Dragons brand each one of their slaves with an emblem called the Hoof of the Dragon. If an escaped slave bearing this mark is seen by anyone, harboring them and not reporting it could be a crime punishable by death. This is a fact that is so frightening and well known that even Boa Hancock and her sisters were deadly afraid of even their own subjects ever seeing it. So afraid that they concocted an elaborate story about having the eyes of a Gorgon on their back, capable of turning all that sees it to stone. So in order to avoid this life of fear, Tiger employed a clever solution. Compiling a crew of the escaped fishmen slaves and those that wanted to rebel against the world government, he began to brand each one with a new mark. But instead of standing for their subjugation, this was a mark of freedom. By perfectly covering the symbol of the hoof of the dragon with this new emblem of the sun, it was no longer possible to tell the difference between those among the crew that were escaped slaves and those that weren't. However, where I think many people become confused is the fact that this new symbol of the sun unfortunately didn't completely free the former slaves. I think it's evident from the fact that Hachi still covers up his mark in Sabaody that the world government has clearly caught on to their tactic. However, the true purpose of their new mark wasn't to fool the government at all. It was a mark of solidarity. Former slave or not, if any of their members were captured, they would all share the same fate. One that would likely be even crueler given the determination of the world government to send a message as punishment for so brazenly rebelling against the celestial dragons. And this is the very mark that Arlong and the members of his crew bear, as after the assassination of Fisher Tiger, the Sun Pirates split into three factions. So this alone would perfectly explain why Arlong and his crew wouldn't be taken to Impel Down, as they are all indistinguishably marked as potential property of the Celestial Dragons, and members of Fisher Tiger's infamous crew. However, I know that some of you may be thinking that there is a slight hole in this theory, because during our look into Arlong and the Sun Pirates' past, we also learned that not only was Jinbei held and impelled down before the Marineford War, but Arlong and his crew were once captured and taken to impel down. So, does this blow a hole in our theory? Well, thankfully no. Not at all. See, the only times Fishman have ever gone to Impel Down in the series is when they are specifically being blackmailed or used as bargaining chips. Jimbe, for example, was in prison for defying the summons to fight Whitebeard in their upcoming battle against him. But this arrest was merely more of a timeout until he was willing to cooperate, or until after the war had concluded, where they would most likely have released him to maintain his role in the Warlords and keep their delicate balance of the Three Powers. This logic can also be applied to the time that Arlong and his crew were sent to prison as well. To explain this, we just need to look back to the events surrounding the dissolution of the crew. After Tiger's death, the crew encountered a problem. While each and every member shared the same goals and dreams as Tiger, Without his leadership, they began taking different paths to bringing the Fishmen race out of subjugation. The first group began to follow under Jinbei, who wanted to be able to live peacefully with humans. The second group consisted of Arlong's followers, those who wanted to not only live equal to humans, but rise above them and rule with the same terror and cruelty that they had experienced. And the last group were a bunch of scummy, creepy, nasty, shit-sniffing lowlifes who, after witnessing everything Tiger and their crewmates went through, decided to become human and fishman traffickers. The group I'm referring to are the Macro Pirates, who you may remember as the ones who literally tried to kidnap and sell Kami to a life of torture. It seems their approach to elevating the status of fishmen in the world was to begin by increasing their own personal financial standings. But not long after the three new factions of the Sun Pirates emerged, the world government was finally able to catch up to Arlong, and they captured each and every one of his men, and notably shipping them off to Impel Down immediately. But similarly to Jimbei, 
I believe the only reason they weren't taken as slaves straight away would be because the world government was planning to use them as bargaining chips. By taking Arlong's crew hostage, the government was able to blackmail Jinbei into joining the seven warlords of the sea. In exchange for his servitude, Jinbei demanded the freedom of Arlong's crew from Impel Down, and the reversal of the Sun Pirate status as escaped slaves. Most of the former Sun Pirates were rather pleased with this result, and took up the opportunity to return to Fishman Island in their regular normal lives. But Arlong was still unsatisfied, and decided to leave to the East Blue, often known for being the weakest of all four seas, in pursuit of, in a way, reenacting his trauma upon the citizens who reside there, all with the full protection of Jimbei's government-sanctioned position. But unfortunately for Arlong, not long after his capture, Jinbei decided to abduct his position in the Warlords by defying their summons to Marineford, and then later breaking out of the prison to fight alongside Luffy in their attempt to save Ace. And at that point, his and the Sun Pirate status as escaped slaves was reinstated, causing the once retired members of the Sun Pirates to leave their homes and join up with Jinbei once again, where they reformed the Sun Pirates and have gone back to a life on the run. And at the same time, quite possibly dooming Arlong's crew to a guaranteed life of enslavement. So now that we have a good idea as to why the Fishman in the series are likely being enslaved in Mary Joa, I want to fulfill my promise from earlier. Because with all of the elements finally aligned, I think I can see a very clear direction that Oda plans to take not only Arlong, but also a direction that could impact the rest of the series. As I mentioned earlier, the last time we had a prison break, Oda did a great job of setting it up in the background, without drawing too much suspicion to himself. But this time, we're all a bit more experienced, and most fans have come to understand a bit more as to what they should expect from Oda. And now, as we approach the final saga, people have begun to notice the signs of something big to come. Our first major sign was just after the conclusion of Wano, when Marco returned to Sphinx Island, only to discover the town was recovering from a recent battle. This is when the OG Stussy, Miss Buckingham, emphatically exclaimed that her precious and alleged son of Whitebeard, Weevil, had been captured and taken prisoner by the Navy Admiral Greenbull just before he himself left on his way to Wano. But Bakken doesn't just inform us of the recent ongoings of the island. She specifically requests Marco help her in rescuing her son, hoping that even the faint possibility that he is Newgate's son is enough for him to go along. While we never got Marco's answer, we did get two more potential members of our next prison breakout, as once Greenbull arrived in Wano, he made short work of Kaido's recovering commanders draining King and Queen of their life force and adding them to his prisoner collection. So already, the pieces of this next breakout are starting to align. Our role of breakout -er goes to Marco. King and Queen rather fittingly serve our role of King and Queen. And, of course, this rather unfortunately would make Weevil our new ace. But there's still one more role to fill if Oda was planning a similar narrative framework to the previous breakout. Who will be our crocodile, our former villain with the redemption arc? If we assume that Impel Down 2.0 will also take place at Impel Down, then the question is obvious, and the stand-in for this version of events would be Doflamingo, which would certainly make a lot of sense, especially since we've gotten to check in on him from time to time, and he fits the role almost perfectly. But I want you to stop to consider two things. First, Doflamingo is an asshole, through and through, and while Oda has let us have glimpses of Mingo down in Impel Down, it's important to note that he's also gone out of his way to show just how locked down he is. Not only is this man chained to the wall, but Magellan is posted outside of his cell day in and day out. Additionally, now that the events of the story are reaching their peak at the far end of the New World, bringing the focus of the story all the way back to the paradise half of the Grand Line at a time like this seems like a strange idea from a narrative standpoint at least. But what if there was another location where this breakout could occur? One that quite recently in the story has been highlighted as the battleground between the Celestial Dragons and the Revolutionary Army. 
That's right, what if Mary Joa will be the location of our Impel Down 2.0? And I think Oda has actually been secretly building to this in the manga. Since the start of Egghead, we've learned more and more about the starvation tactics currently being used by the Revolutionary Army to apply pressure to the Celestial Dragons. By cutting off all outside access to food and sabotaging the gondolas that transport people and goods up and down the red line, the Celestial Dragons are beginning to experience hunger and having to go without for the first time in their lives, and it's already had some massive impacts. Additionally, because of the nature of the Red Line in the One Piece world, each and every one of Green Bull's newly captured prisoners are going to have to pass over the Red Line and thus through Mary Joa in order for them to reach Impel Down in the first place. However, once again, that's assuming Impel Down is even the final destination for these prisoners in the first place. I think it's rather important to point out that each one of the newly captured prisoners, like Arlong, all have a good chance of being held indefinitely in Mary Joa. The first and most likely future prisoner of Mary Joa is King, who as a member of the Lunarian race is one of the most highly sought after beings on the planet. The world government simply can't wait to research him and his abilities, especially as they attempt to recreate the Mother Flame. And while we're on the topic of science, Queen is also a candidate for holding on Mary Joa as a former member of MADS and master of Devil Fruit technology. Queen would be a great resource in strengthening the Navy Science Division, especially after the death of Vegapunk. And I also fully expect him to agree to working as a government scientist over being sentenced to prison. And finally, we have Weevil, who I believe also has a good chance of ending up as a slave to the Celestial Dragons. Not for anything he has done personally, but as punishment for all of his father's transgressions against the world government. I think he will likely receive the same treatment as Kuma, as a way of trying to hurt Whitebeard even after his death. So when considering that we're going to have these three big shots all converging on Mary Joa at a time when the world government and celestial dragons are literally at their weakest, I think this has set us up for the perfect breakout storyline. But even with all of our key players identified, what is the likelihood that Arlong, a character from the very first section of the series, will be able to play a pivotal role in the final saga of the story? Well, I have one piece of evidence that not only proved that Oda hasn't forgotten about Arlong in the events of his arc in East Blue, but will link all of the elements of this theory together perfectly and completely blow your mind. If we look back at our very first hints of an Impel Down 2.0, Marco's interaction with Bakken, there was a very subtle callback included in that same chapter that stands out in relation to this theory. During the chapter, we receive a brief flashback regarding the events that led up to Green Bull being sent to the island in the first place. You see, the day Weevil arrived on Sphinx Island to confront Marco about his supposed inheritance, he discovered that he wasn't the first intruder to arrive that day, as just before him, a group of marines landed on the island, hoping to take advantage of Marco's absence and shake down the citizens of the non-government aligned nation. And leading this group of corrupt soldiers was a marine by the name of Rattle, who bears a shocking resemblance to a certain other corrupt marine from the Arlong Park arc. Not only do Nezumi and Rattle share the same appearance and actions in the story, but Rattle's defeat at the hands of Weevil are a one-to-one -one recreation of when Nami smacked the life out of Nezumi way back in East Blue. And knowing Oda's writing abilities, there's no way this reference is a coincidence. Him intentionally tying the very first hints of Impel Down 2.0 to Arlong Park is an excellent way to begin an arc that will be bringing Arlong back to the story. And now that we have uncovered the rough outline of this arc, I want to go one step further and examine the likely role that Arlong is going to play in this upcoming arc, and how I believe it will lead to a redemption arc like none other. Whether intentionally or unintentionally, Oda has possibly put Arlong in a position to receive the greatest redemption arc in manga history. For many viewers, Arlong is the very first One Piece villain that they truly hated. 
from what he did to Belmare, his schemes against Nami, and his subjugation of the citizens of the Konami Islands. But as we learn from his past during Fishman Island, Arlong is a more sympathetic villain than most of us ever initially predicted. But gaining sympathy is only the first step in redeeming a character, and despite his tragic past and upbringing, many won't accept Arlong until after he has put in the work to atone for his actions. So what can Arlong do to make up for his discrimination against humans? And more importantly, what would make the most sense for him from a narrative perspective? And when considering Oda's propensity for using closed circular narratives, I think the choice is quite clear. You see, Fisher Tiger was more to Arlong than just a captain and mentor. To Arlong, he was the closest thing he had to a father, as he was abandoned by his own father at an early age and didn't see him again until his teenage years, when his good-for-nothing father popped back up and left him to care for his younger half-sister Charlotte. The pair grew up in the lawless area of Fishman Island, known as the Fishman District. So from an early age, not only did this expose him to the cruelty of the pirates who often passed through here on their way into the new world, but also the bigotry and discrimination that human beings can truly be capable of. And it really isn't too difficult to say that Fisher Tiger was really the only positive male role model in Arlong's life. So Arlong happily respected and served Tiger as a surrogate father which is the reason Arlong spiraled out of control after he was assassinated by the government. His lifetime of negative experiences and now the death of his chosen father was too much for him to handle, and he's been on a rampage against humans ever since. So if Arlong was going to get a redemption arc, it should be somewhat themed around Fisher Tiger and the pair's troubled experiences with humans. So by now, you may be able to see where I'm going with this, but I believe that once the Revolutionary Army launches their next attack, or perhaps even Blackbeard if he beats them to it, Arlong will champion the next great slave breakout of Mary Joa and lead the members of the Sun Pirates who have been enslaved there to freedom. But in order to break his cycle of hatred for humanity once and for all, Arlong will need to follow in Fisher Tiger's footsteps and free more than just the fishmen. He'll have to put aside his hatred for humanity and the wrongdoings they've committed in his life once and for all, and free the human slaves he encounters as well. Then, despite his atrocities in the East Blue, thousands of slaves, human and fishmen alike, would consider him their savior, washing away some of his transgressions, ensuring that Fisher Tiger's legacy was not one of mere hatred and discrimination, but one of freedom and equality. And once Arlong and the newly freed slaves escape to the East Blue, Arlong can copy his predecessor, and for the first time, fully extend the mark of the sun to all of the races that were enslaved, redeeming his name, Tiger's legacy, and spreading the message of the sun and the freedom it brings throughout the world. So, tell me in the comments, what do you think? Are you excited for another Prison Break arc? And have I convinced you that Arlong will be at the center of it? It certainly seems like Oda is up to something with him, and this is a time in the story where absolutely everyone seems to be popping back up in some form or another. So if you enjoyed the video, or if I at least kept you entertained, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you'd like to see more of me, then make sure to subscribe to the channel. I'm really hoping we can make it to 10k by the end of the year. So if you're interested in joining the crew, please don't hesitate to do so. And if you want to enjoy more of my theories on our East Blue antagonists, then check out my theory videos on Captain Kuro and Dong Krieg. I promise they won't disappoint. But that's all I have for you now, so I hope you enjoyed. Until next time, thank you for coming to the Crap Cafe. Yeah.